The Nuclear Regulatory Commission was subjected to a string of freedom of information requests in the days following the crippling of the nuclear facility in Fukushima, Japan. The documents released through these requests reveal that we've been deceived about the true nature of what happened at the complex and how dire the situation is there. Moreover, these official documents, which encompass email trails and transcripts of phone conversations among head officials, directly contradict the official story, including what we were told about current goings-on at the plant. Musician and citizen journalist Tony Muga, who goes by the pseudonym Patrick Penry, is largely responsible for bringing this documentation to the attention of the wider public. He has a complete archive on his site, hatrickpenry.wordpress.com, and he joins us now from Gainesville, Florida. Thank you for joining us, uh, Tony. Thanks, Michael, and I appreciate the introduction there. You did a great job, and it's a pleasure and honor to be on your broadcast because, as we, I talked to you before, I mentioned I've referred to global research numerous times in my investigations, and a number of articles there have uh, really been pieces of the puzzle for me to help me to put together a better picture. So I, I can thank you guys for that, if nothing else, right now. Well, appreciate it very much, uh, Tony, because it's certainly uh, this does seem to be a uh, what you've exposed seems to be uh, you know, quite a quite a shocker. <laughs> um, so, so it starts with these freedom of information requests. Could you, uh, who who exactly filed these freedom of information requests in the first place? Well, initially there are a couple of groups that I'm aware of that filed for the documents, and Friends of the Earth was one group. The other group was the Associated. Now, there may have been other people in between, but I'm not aware of, of any other specifics. But between those two, and especially the Associated Press, I'm told, is sent to offer about 90% of the request. So if you go to the NRC website and you log in and you look, the vast majority of those, according to what my research indicates, are being filed by someone at the Associated Press. I'm not familiar with who, but that would be kind of who... Some of these environmental groups initiated and filed in initially right after the event happened. By late June, uh, early July, documents were beginning to collect into that online pool on the NRC database. Mm. Okay, so you, you can connect. Uh, I mean, is there a pattern to, like you mentioned, both the Associated Press and uh, environmental groups? Uh, is there any kind of a pattern in terms of who's re requesting what, or is it all pretty much the same uh, territory? It just seems to me, Michael, that uh, at least with the Associated Press, because I think Friends of Earth just initially filed for a, a few documents here and there. AP has been consistently filing for them, and it just seems, if I were to make a guess, I think they're just making a wide-sweeping grab and trying to acquire as much of a range of information as possible. I can't specifically look and say, oh, they're trying to get this kind of uh, telephone transcript or this specific date or so on and so forth. So I think it's just a wide-range grab to get all the transcripts and telephone conversations, emails, all that kind of information, and get it into a, a body on the NRC website where you or I or anyone can uh, go in there and research and get into it. Hmm. Now, um, you, uh, how did you come to uh, discover this information? Okay, initially there was a website online. I've been critical of some of these websites because they – they didn't give that much information. They could have done so much more. But to their credit, uh, e-informable, uh, the Lucas Hickson site, and the Joy Thompson was, I don't know if she still writes with informable or not, but she had a really great article early on that called it a can of worms. It opened up a quote, can of worms. And I thought to myself, yeah, this is worms, all right. So, But I will say this, Michael, on the whole, it's been very suppressed. in studying controlled opposition since, February of 2012, when I would send this information out, myself and uh, other researchers, and it was largely ignored. And we didn't cover everybody. Like, I never contacted Michael Rupert. I don't know why I never did. I never thought of it. But I sent to other uh, websites and alternative media outlets, and, and they basically ignored it. So I, I, I liken it to a, a fumble on the football field, and I'm looking around at all these better runners and better players, and they don't pick up the ball. And so I just grab it and run a few feet and set it down. Hmm. Well, yeah, I, it's 
Yeah, like how do you in- interpret that? I mean, you mentioned the term controlled demolition. Is there possibly a, a simpler a- explanation? Uh, maybe just uh, what was that? I guess there's that saying: the bigger the lie, the the, har- the, the, the harder it is to believe well, that. That's, <laughs> that's true, and they're they're they have a very well put together fault scenario and a fault accountability of what the damage, what happened there. In this book I'm writing now, I'm going to explain and go into greater detail. Yes, there's a cover-up to protect our nuclear industry. But if you want to look at that tsunami drill and go into the conspiracy theory area, I believe there's other reasons as well. I'm going to flesh that out in this book I'm working on now. So I'm mm-hmm. tend to right now just you know, until I've done more research and, and done some more. So far, my hypothesis has held water tight, but until I'm really confident with it and I finish uh, this thing I'm writing right now, I just kind of want to hold off on that. So what we, like I say with Rupert, I told him we can all agree that, that there was some damage there. We know it was pretty catastrophic, and, and just judging from the amount of damage and the effects of what that are going to be, I think in an open forum and discussion, most informed Americans would agree with us that as soon as we can, we need to start looking into some means of decommissioning plants and providing some alternative uh, means of power. Maybe even Americans saying to themselves, we might need to adjust our lifestyles a little bit and maybe not use so much power. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Now, the, um, the what with the, the, the documentation uh, that uh, was disclosed, uh, it includes... Uh, you know, e- email trails, but also includes transcripts of phone conversations. Is this uh, uh, like among head officials? Um, the, these sorts of conversations uh, is, is that essentially a requirement that uh, in all of these discussions that they're all recorded? That that is my understanding, uh, Michael. That there's in a, an emergency like this. In fact, they, they actually do transcriptions from all their meetings around the country, public meetings. The NRC documents pretty much everything they do, and, and, the, and there's an emergency or some kind of event, the recorders are on, they're keeping everything, but the thing is, my understanding is, you won't ever even hear that unless someone files for uh, the transcripts and the phone conversations. Yes, they record it, but unless somebody out here on the outside world requests it, you know, they just hold on to it and, you know, might yeah. not get to see anything at all if we're not requesting it. So Freedom of Information Act, I tell you, it's one of the most beautiful things this country has going for it. Yeah, it's like certainly, I mean, even in dealing with uh, you know police officers, I mean, they'll, uh, they'll basically be able to get away with things by not uh, – <laughs> as long as you don't know your rights, they're not sort of obliged to tell you, and they, they can capitalize on that. So it sounds like the same kind of principle. Very similar, exactly. <laughs> Good example. Okay. Now, uh, let, let, let's talk about um, some of these uh, main disclosures. I, I know one of them has to do with the uh, the, the spent fuel pool number four. Um, now, just to, to define our terms, I mean, what exactly are we talking about when we, we talk about a spent fuel pool? Okay, that's where the fuel that has been in the reactor and been used to its full potential, at least according to our current technology, once they're done with that fuel and it's in a very excited, heated state, it's very hot, you have to put it into a a temporary holding pool with a special coolant water that's circulating to keep it cool. And it has to stay there a number of years until the temperature comes down enough where they can offload it into what's called a dry cask and then store it, you know, for long-term storage somewhere else. So that spent fuel pool is a, it, it's, it's many meters deep. I'm not exactly certain how many meters, but these control rods are many meters long. A person can't just lift one up yourself. They have that big machine, take them in and out, as many have seen in the TEPCO videos alleging to be Unit 4. So it's simply just a temporarily uh, a place to hold these heated fuel rods until they cool enough to dry cast them for permanent storage. Okay. Now, uh, what we've been told in, in recent weeks, uh, starting on the 18th, that there is a major operation to remove fuel rods from the assemblies in these um, spent fuel pools. 
uh, to, to do it safely. And there's been a lot of controversy of whether or not TEPCO, Tokyo Ec- uh, Electric Power Corporation, is competent enough to do all that. And, uh, you know, a lot of uh, associated commentary coming from experts like Arnie Gunderson. But what, what have you revealed about f- spent fuel pool number four that would seem to, um, I don't know, contradict a lot of the current news we're hearing? Okay, first, I quickly want to say that I'm not an absolute expert on nuclear power, and but there are other people who are, but they don't want to speak out about these documents. So to be clear, I'm kind of learning as I go along, and, and if I make a mistake, I'll go back and like today on your show, I kind of made a correction from uh, FOIA stuff on Rupert's show. I, I misspoke about these documents. They're ongoing and so on and so forth. So I just want to be clear, I'm not... Uh, expert. The ones who are, I would say, are kind of remaining quiet on these documents. Now, mm. that being said, with spent fuel pool number four, in these documents, there on number four, there's a mountain of evidence. I mean, it's huge. I could write another giant article again with all new stuff because it's consistent that four had some kind of a leak and loss of inventory. And when that happened, there's what they call a zirconium fire, the cladding on the spent fuel. It reaches a temperature where it bursts into flames. It's very difficult to extinguish. It's called a pyrophoric fire. You can't just spray water on it necessarily. It's like magnesium burning. So in these documents, there's just so much evidence that there's a melt on the floor, rubble on the floor, walls blown out. I mean, it's I kind of beat a dead horse when I start reading from this one document because it's it's so obvious to me, you know. And then when Rupert looked into this stuff and felt so strong about it, I, that made me feel even better because always in my mind, I'm, I always double check and rethink and I, I try and, you know, hammer, get into my, debunk my own stuff if I can. And, and, and so, so far, this is pretty watertight. If you look at the TEPCO footage, there's nothing conclusive that doesn't say it's not stock footage or they're shooting it down at Diani. And TEPCO's notoriously. Um, inaccurate with their information, I'll put it that way. So just a wealth of information in there that walls blown out, loss of inventory, Zerk fire. The IAEA admitted to a nine-hour fire in the spent fuel pool. So compare that to what everybody else is saying. And somewhere along the line, there's a massive uh, schism between, the. on the one hand, that the spent fuel pool is they're going to unload the fuel. On the other hand, there's probably not any fuel left. <laughs> you know, one mm. of the two is wrong. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, well, you're, you're talking about, uh, and I appreciate that that clarification. Um, but but you are pointing to documentation, which is yes. you know, yes. the official. This is, again, this is the Freedom of Information Act. This is anyone can go online, look at the documentation. On my book, I link on my multiple smaller articles and all my videos. I have plenty of links and everywhere. And like Michael Rupert said to a detractor who was accusing me of putting up fake um, um, emails and stuff. If you anyone were to do that, that is a major federal offense that they will definitely throw your butt in jail, your door will be kicked in, and you're gone. So it's all drawn from the NRC Freedom of Information Act. And might I say, the information in there is so damning, and nobody needs to make anything up. Just what's already there paints an incredible picture of this grandiose, orchestrated cover-up, whatever their reasons are for doing it. You know, and I'm working on that in my new book is to try to give more reasons as to what's going on on the, the global chessboard that's unfolding here. Mm. Talking about the uh, global, um, what about the, the effects in terms of the radiation that was released, the, the plume uh, all that, that's gone up over Japan and towards North America? Is there anything revelatory there that, that needs to be brought to the public's attention in terms of what was known at the time? Well, at the at immediately following the accident, if you read those documents, you know just on their own testimony alone that they were aware there was some massive releases. I mean, they pretty much knew it was a worst, what they call a worst case scenario. That means there's no water, no electricity, no coolant for days and days on end. I found a piece in there by Chuck Cass, who was the uh, the lead in the response team in Japan from the NRC, and he's been consistent all all along that how severe the damage was early on. So if you, even without the FOIA documents, if, if you study Chernobyl and read the cost and consequences study, I link to this on my uh, blog and website, if you read the one really legitimate study, you know that there's, you just don't get out of one of these accidents without there being some kind of effect as far as mortality rate, heart problems, mutation, genetic effects, leukemia, that kind of thing. 
if I take that and I just, in my mind, think about how Fukushima is playing out and the releases from all these source terms, what they call it, each reactor or spent fuel pool that would produce radiation, it's simply, it's, it's absolutely uh, ridiculous to assert that there would be no effect over here. Like I say, there's been a number of studies now. You can look at the Sherman Mangano a mortality index study that's been revised and updated. Uh, there's the uh, online activist Bobby One who has a very excellent, very well researched uh, mortality index study as well. And then you have recently the thyroid study that I believe Busby, Sherman, and Mangano participated in as well. And and if you look close, you can hear about cancer clusters and starfish dying and all this. I mean, it's, it's right in our face. But I think denial is some kind of coping mechanism for a lot of people, Michael, and they're. They're just trying to cope right now. With, I'm not saying it's an extinction-level event. I'm not going that far because I don't know. I don't know. Mm. I think a lot of people are in denial about the ongoing effects. They're kind of obvious to me. And keep in mind, let me finish here, that in the studies in, from Chernobyl, it's always like five years plus down the road that the latent cancers and effects really kick in. So we're just on the border, on the cusp of really feeling some of the effects from uh, this catastrophe. Mm. Now, uh, the... Uh as you mentioned, it's a requirement that uh, in an emergency situation that all of the communications are documented. And that that leads me to believe that, I mean, if there is a, like a cover-up going on, that you're really kind of having to read between the lines. Because I would imagine that people who know that they're being recorded uh, would be kind of guarded in the way they convey their information. Uh, is is that, uh, I mean, I, even though there's a lot that's come out already, I mean, you, you having any sense of sort of deeper uh, deeper things that, uh, that that are not being said that you, you're having to kind of piece together? Okay, well, there's certainly there's redaction. For instance, there was a page that said, spent fuel pool number four, boil off calculation. And then you had 20 pages that were blank. Total redaction. So, no, I didn't get to see that, but when I combine that with everything else on unit number four, I'm like, yeah, it's a lot worse than what they're letting on. And, and you make a great point. They, some of them now, not, and again, not everybody's in on the conspiracy now. I, I'm not, it's not, it's not that big of a conspiracy. On the lower level, I'm convinced some people are newbies and rookies just coming in. They don't know. One guy's almost kind of reprimanded when he gets carried away and he's talking about unit four melt on the floor, if it sublimates, will it go into the torus? And the guy says, hey, 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 just so you're aware. He doesn't say, shut up, we're being recorded, although in one part I got, the guy says, hey, we're on a recorded line, and we need to take it to a non-recorded line, so they're aware they're being recorded. Some of them are actually, you're correct, they have to edit what they say, they're not as revealing. And I, I did a broadcast on Blog Talk Radio, my blog, blog Talk Radio show when I used to do it, where I talked about the NRC's response to a catastrophe is actually inhibited because they're some players. Some players are aware they're being recorded and they're editing what they say, and so they're not forthright and forthcoming with information. So it, the communication is inhibited. And I, I liken it to firefighters showing up at, at your house to put out a fire, and, and they can't say the word axe and they can't say the word hose. They'll still put the fire out, but it might not be in this short of time, if you understand. Mm. I would be watchful of those things that uh, officials are saying among themselves, but they say something completely different to, to the wider public. Uh, I mean, obviously, you, you have that blatant example with the spent fuel pool four, but I mean, I think you also mentioned the, the whole issue of potassium iodide and uh, you know how they, they seem to stress it more when they speak among themselves than when they uh, speak to the wider public. Um, you, you, have you come across several other examples uh, like that? or Well, that's very observant of you. Yes, what I found in, in the back of my book, Something Wicked This Way Comes, I have a section on potassium iodine, KI. And I've got a collection of screen captures from emails. Uh, for instance, I'm trying to think if it was Chuck Casto or who it was that forgotten their uh, stash of potassium iodine and someone was trying to ship some out and get it to him as soon as possible because throughout these documents, they make no bones about it. They don't leave here and go over there without their potassium iodine. Whilst on the public front, to my understanding, they're kind of, you know, indifferent about it and don't want the public to think they really need it. It only treats you for iodine and won't get you for other radioactive substances. It's not that big a deal. But, you know, if you're in a pit full of snakes and there's six different snakes and some 
someone gives you the antidote to one snake, well, that's only five left, and I'd rather only have five snakes after me than six. So. Mm. Well, I, I guess that gets us to the uh, the question of motive. Um, just just to try to clarify what in terms of what your uh, you know the the, the exhaustive uh, thousands of hours of research you've done into this. Do, do you have any? Have you come to any conclusions about? Who is benefiting from from covering up this information? Uh, is it uh, is it about basically straight you know protecting people's asses? Are they concerned that there could be a national panic and everybody's going to want to move from the west coast of North America? Is there you know profits sure. at, at stake? What what's what's the the ultimate motive here to this whole scheme? Well, first of all, to be uh, realistic, well, first let me say yes, they're protecting the nuclear industry, obviously, but. That's the obvious uh, um, indication there, but they're also, uh, you can't be completely honest considering, let me, let me phrase, considering our position around the world with all these nuclear plants and considering their vulnerability in relation to large population centers. This is what I want to say. You cannot be forthright and completely honest. You simply can't on the, not to, not to, uh, make excuses for our government, but if they came out and said, yes, we got to evacuate, you got to get out of Tokyo, or Indian Point melted down, you got to get out of New York, it's not logistically, it's not feasibly possible to evacuate those people. You just cannot do it. And so in their defense, I understand that. But my point in that is that just strikes to the fact we have to, we need an alternative source of power and we need to dry cast this stuff and shut these things down as soon as possible. So. The cover-up is twofold, protect the nuclear industry in the short term, but I mean, I think in the long term we have to look at, we're going to have to shut this stuff down regardless. There's no other way around it. And, and I think they probably know that in the higher levels of government now. Mm. Um, yeah, I, I want to go back to what, what you we were discussing right at the outset, uh, that the Associated Press being uh, responsible for, for filing so many of these uh, Freedom of Information requests in the first place, and you know, <laughs> having gone to all that trouble, and it doesn't seem like they're doing anything with it. I mean, Associated Press, that's that's mainstream, right? That's the, uh, the, the biggest newswire in the world, I believe. And, that's uh, correct, but... But when I, I'm told, I don't know who it is, but I'm told there's one person down there that continues to file and put this evidence on the NRC database. So while on the one hand it's true, Associated Press is not pulling from, you know, what I'm looking at, the worst of the worst in these documents, if anything at all, someone down there is doing something and stockpiling for those who are willing to look into it. So it seems to me like somebody's trying to do something while overall, yes, mainstream totally silent across the board, and alternative media until recently has been very much silent across the board. Oh, okay. So what, what, what just occurs to me as you're saying that is that they're, they're, they're looking to this information. They, they want the information, but not with the intention of disseminating it to the wider public. Correct, because you have to understand that in those higher-level positions or any position in the mainstream media, AP, ABC News, routers, whatever have you, they have to answer to their boss. And, and I've looked into this extensively. There's repercussions if you do try to... Okay, let me say this. In these documents, Michael, you can see where the NRC, and they spend millions to search press. Uh, could be mainstream, could be alternative. They want to know who's writing about them, who's talking about them. Throughout these documents, you see reports coming in on who's writing about Fukushima, who's writing about the NRC. It's mainstream, too. I've seen a couple articles come out in mainstream that weren't that shabby, but they get reported on. NRC knows about it, and they say in one of these emails after Fukushima that they watch social media. They got a feel for what's going on. They send their bloggers out to help set the record straight. I'm kind of paraphrasing, but that's generally what they do. They watch. It's reported to them, and they countermeasure and come out and you know they. I just read an article where Intergy spends millions to hire online. PR people to convince us to relicense Indian Point, which is kind of like our Fukushima waiting to happen next to New York City, if you think about it. Hmm. Well, it looks like our truth-tellers have uh, our work cut out for us, <laughs> given the, the, that kind of, um, I guess, counter... Uh, those sorts of counterattacks that may be on on the horizon, um, yeah. So, so what about uh, briefly? I mean, you, you've already made some forays into to getting this. You've been at it for 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 months. 
and uh, you 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 have the internet as the ally. You you talk as an ally. You talk to to Mike Rupert and and Blog Talk Radio. Uh, what what are some of the uh, your experiences in terms of getting this to the wider public? Uh, you they they say hits the misses. Um, you know the some of the things you might caution against. Well, my experience getting out to the public has been kind of frustrating because for the longest time I would send the information out and post on YouTube channels and try. I would do videos that were remixable. All you had to do was put a punch a few buttons and copy my video, and I found just an incredible resistance to this information going out. And I think there's more to it, though, Michael, in the long run. I hope this piece I'm writing now is going to shed more light on this global picture, why there's such silence. And, and I'll just hint right now, and you guys have shown this on global research. I've seen some good articles on there. I am more coming to understand the dynamics between some of these superpowers in the world and the corporations behind those superpowers and the needs of those corporations and what's going to be playing out on this a planet in the future. And, and I've seen some channels on YouTube called Weather Wars and that kind of thing. That's what I'm interested in right now, these untraceable weapons, tsunami bombs, like General Cohen said, um, earthquakes induced by electromagnetics, volcanoes excited by electromagnetics. If you look back at the Icelandic volcano not too long ago, what was the end result of that? Well, it held up air traffic. People were stuck in airports that brought an economy almost to a standstill. I'm thinking, hey, that could be an economic attack. What's going on on this planet? So I'm kind of looking into that right now to see, is there this sublime, silent war that is unfolding on Earth right now between these superpowers, and, and, and resources are dwindling. And I certainly understand that from some of Rupert's work. So, And back in the day, I took an honors class based on Jared Diamond's book called Collapse. So I went back into that book and started looking at the Mayans and some of these reasons why civilizations <laughs> collapse. It's very interesting and very revealing, and, and hopefully my next piece is going to shed more light on that. Okay, well, you had uh Patrick Penry, Tony Muga, uh, it's been a, a great uh, pleasure to uh, to speak with you and, and to help bring the, your uh, research forward. Again, your your website is hatrickpenry.wordpress.com, and your book is Something Wicked This Way Comes. Is there anything else you wanted to uh, relay to our listeners before we close? You can uh, catch me on YouTube, and I have some original songs. I'm, I really prefer to be a musician, but if there's need for someone to right i'm willing to do that and i just want to give you a you know a word of thanks and i want to give global research a little bit of praise because really you by having me on now as far as i'm concerned in my humble opinion you guys have really legitimized yourself as covering a very broad range of topics right now i mean i've seen almost anything and everything come across your a website so really now you've gone into the for you documents you've covered the plume gate thing and you guys are doing an excellent job Okay. We really appreciate that, uh, Tony, and certainly we, we appreciate the hard work you put into this, uh, uh, this effort on your part. So thanks again for uh, joining us on the Global Research News Hour. Thank you. I've been speaking with uh, Tony Muga, otherwise known as Hatrick Penry. Uh, he has revealed a number of jo- documents that have been put forward uh, to the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission relating to the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear disaster. And that marks the end of our show for this week. We would like to welcome our newest partner, Port Perry Radio in Port Perry, Ontario, which airs the Global Research News Hour Thursdays at 1 p.m. You've been listening to the Global Research News Hour. You can hear our programs every week on CKUW 95.9 FM in Winnipeg and on partnering radio stations across the country. We are broadcast on the Progressive Radio Network at prn.fm. You can also download each episode from the website globalresearch.ca. To leave feedback on this program, email globalresearchnewshour at gmail.com. We need to get subscribed and get this unity stronger and beat YouTube at their own game. Okay, that's what this is about. Like I say, go to the Remix button, hit the Remix button. That way you'll have this video and, and keep up with this. Otherwise, you know, YouTube's just going to control us, guys, and it's, it's really bad.